Hi, and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases, and UK true crime. Today, we're going to be exploring the unsolved murder of Harry Howell in Blackpool in 1988. Harry's murder was both unexpected and also mysterious, given that his neighbours hadn't noticed that he'd been murdered for a while and he seemed like an unlikely victim. Harry's murder is still unsolved and the reasons behind it still a mystery. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Blackpool is a seaside resort located in Lancashire and lies around 27 miles away from Liverpool and around 40 miles away from Manchester. It's a popular holiday and day trip destination for many people who live in Lancashire. And as one of these Lancashire residents, I can attest that many a weekend was spent there. It's probably most famous for the Blackpool Tower, which when it was built in 1894 was the tallest building in the British Empire as it was then. The tower was inspired by the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and while they look very similar, Blackpool Tower isn't freestanding, and its base is hidden by a building at the bottom of it. The Tower Ballroom at the top of the structure has long been famous for the dances that took place there, as well as in the present day, where concerts, dance competitions and the grand final of Strictly Come Dancing has taken place. Blackpool is also famous for its Pleasure Beach, which is a large theme park on the seafront, and also for the Blackpool Illuminations. The Illuminations is a show that has been running since 1879, and occurs annually between September and January. In the past, the Illuminations had only ran for around 66 days. However, since then, the time has been extended. They run the whole distance of 6.2 miles along the promenade, and people come from all over to see them throughout this period. Blackpool is abuzz with activity during this time, as well as during the summer, when tourists flock to the beach for sunbathing and days out. Blackpool was the home of Harry Howell. In 1988, Harry was 74 years old, and he had just suffered a bereavement. His long-term partner, Elsie Flegg, had just passed away, and he was facing living by himself for the first time in a long time, and this was a worrying concept for his family. Harry and Elsie had been living in sheltered accommodation called Imberson Court located just a stone's throw away from the promenade in the centre of Blackpool. Living in sheltered accommodation meant that Harry and Elsie lived in their own flat, however they were also looked in on by a warden who helped the elderly residents who lived there. Harry's family were worried about how Harry would cope since Elsie had passed away and were concerned about his day-to-day living arrangements. Harry had worked for the company British Leyland for many years. British Leyland was a car manufacturer which made cars such as the Mini, Land Rover, Jaguar and Austin. In his later years, however, Harry's health began to deteriorate and by 1988 he had suffered a stroke, which led to partial paralysis and meant he was blind in one eye. Harry still got out and about though and he enjoyed having a bet and going to the pub for a pint. In early winter 1988 after Elsie had died, Harry's family tried to make sure he was looked after and helped him to establish a routine. Harry's nephew spoke to the staff at the nearby Leagate Cafe on Central Drive, close to Harry's home at Iberson Court and told them that Harry would be coming in every day and could they make sure that he had a substantial meal at least once a day. This fact showed that while Harry was independent, he may well forget to look after himself, and it also showed that his family wanted to look out for him. He would regularly visit the cafe and other pubs around the town, particularly the George pub where he would go in for a pint. Harry was friendly and loved speaking to people and would often stop strangers to talk. The other neighbours at Iberson Court, however, knew him as a relatively reserved person who kept to himself when he was at home. It appeared that Harry had his routine and enjoyed the social aspect of getting out of the house, 
However, when he was at home, he enjoyed his home comforts and his own company. By early November, Harry had established a routine and was slowly moving on from Elsie's death. Conversations with the warden who oversaw the sheltered accommodation showed that Harry was doing well in his home and was beginning to feel more himself after Elsie had passed away. Saturday the 5th of November, bonfire night in the UK, and this was the last weekend that the illuminations were going to be on. People were coming into the area to catch them before they went for the year, and people would also be leaving the area, having come for holidays or for day trips to see them. The warden at Iberson Court was the first person to see Harry that day. She visited the residents of Iberson Court every morning except Sundays, and this day was no exception. She later explained that she visited him at his flat that morning and had a conversation. She said she left at around half nine and that Harry seemed happy and his usual self. Around an hour later, Harry was spotted again, this time at the Leagate Cafe where he usually had his breakfast. The waitress at the cafe knew Harry well and so didn't think anything of him being there that morning. That day, however, she did notice something a little bit different. A man who was described as well-dressed came in and bought a cup of tea. He then went and sat down with Harry and started talking to him. It appeared that the two knew one another and the waitress went over to say that if she'd have known that he was with Harry, he would have put the tea on the bill. Harry reportedly offered to pay for the man's tea and she replied that the man had already paid for it himself. This was the only time that the staff at the cafe had noticed Harry with this man and so it stood out to them. The staff described the man as being tall, broadly built and was wearing a fawn-coloured raincoat and a soft trilby-style hat. Due to Harry's regularity and love of routine, many of the shopkeepers and shop assistants knew him and knew what he regularly bought. One of the shops on Central Drive that knew Harry well was Burton's Confectioners. Harry went to the shop every day at lunchtime and always bought a pie. The staff knew Harry well and always noticed when he came in. That day, however, something a little strange happened. A younger man, aged in his thirties, visited the shop and told the shop assistant a story. The man, who was later described as having hair falling over his thin, drawn face, said he was buying a sandwich for the old man who usually came into the shop to buy a pie. The shop assistant thought this was odd, but asked him what sandwich he was looking for. He said that the old man had asked for a meat sandwich, and he eventually settled on buying a beef and horseradish one. He actually bought two of these before leaving. The shop assistant remembered this as there were only two beef and horseradish sandwiches that were sold at the shop that day. This in itself was out of the ordinary for Harry, and certainly was out of character. However, by 4pm, Harry was seen again out and about. A family remembered speaking to him that day for almost 20 minutes. They didn't know Harry, but had got speaking to him in the street. It appeared that Harry was being his normal sociable self and was enjoying having a conversation with this family before they set off to carry on with their day. It appeared that by the evening of the 5th of November, Harry had headed back to his flat at Iberson Court and spent the night there. The next day, Sunday the 6th of November, the warden always contacted the residents the same way. She rang the internal intercom in the flat to contact the residents, asked them if they needed anything and if they were okay. That day, the warden rang through to Harry's flat and he answered. She reported that he said he was fine and she left him to his day. The milkman also arrived that day and dropped off Harry's usual bottle of milk that he'd ordered. On Monday the 7th of November, the warden again started her rounds to check on the residents and when she passed Harry's flat, this time she noticed something in the glass of the window pane in the door. A piece of white card had been placed there 
This was a system that the residents had to let the warden know that they'd gone out for a while and that this might be why they don't answer. This was a system that was well known to all of the residents and therefore the warden didn't worry about this as she passed by Harry's flat. Despite the fact that Harry had a very well-known routine, there didn't appear to be much concern about him over these few days. There were many explanations for why Harry had not been seen. The next day, on Tuesday the 8th of November, the milkman came to Harry's flat again. He left the milk on the step and would later report that he did notice the white card in the inside of the glass, as the warden had done the day before. About an hour later, after the milkman had delivered the milk, the home help assistant, who often came to visit the residents and check up on them, arrived at Harry's flat. She would later report seeing something unusual pinned to the front door. It was a note which read something to the effect of, on holiday for two weeks, no milk please. Once again, the home help read the note and just thought that Harry must be away and went on with her day. Around half an hour after the home help assistant had visited Harry's flat, the deputy warden from the sheltered accommodation passed by the flat on her rounds. She recalled that there was a note pinned to the door. The odd thing was that the milkman did not recall seeing a note stuck on the door and only noticed the white card placed inside the glass pane and as a result he still dropped off milk that day. That same day another witness came by Harry's home. This time it was the window cleaner, John Johnston. He later explained that he did not see a note pinned to the door and he had a reason to be close to it as he was cleaning the glass pane. He did, however, notice something else. While he was cleaning other windows in the area, he watched as a man approached Harry's door and knocked on. Harry didn't answer and the man eventually walked away. Another two days passed and the milkman once again called at Harry's home. This time when he approached the door he noticed that Tuesday's milk was still outside and that Harry hadn't taken it in. The milkman assumed that Harry must have gone away without telling him and just took the milk away instead. It had been around four days by this point since anyone had spoken to Harry and five days since anyone had seen him in person. This, however, was not noticed, and due to many different people seeing different things at Harry's flat, a big picture was never created, and this fact didn't seem to have been fully understood. It wasn't until 12 days later that John Johnston, the window cleaner, began to become concerned. He had once again come to clean the windows of Harry's flat and the other residences in Iberson Court. This time, when he approached Harry's door, he noticed that there was some damage to it. It looked as though someone had tried to pry it open, and some of the paint and wood had come away from the hinge. The door seemed to be still locked and secure, though. The window cleaner, however, wasn't happy with what he'd seen, and he became concerned. He decided to go around the back of the flat and look through the back windows. When he looked closely, he noticed something that confirmed his worries. He saw Harry Howell's body slumped in a chair in the living room, and he didn't appear to be moving. The window cleaner reported what he'd seen, and emergency services came out to Iberson Court to see what had happened. Unfortunately, seeing ambulances and paramedics at sheltered accommodation was not uncommon, given the age of the residents. However, this time it was different. When they entered the home and assessed Harry's body, it was clear that he had not just simply passed away while sat in his living room. Harry had severe head wounds, and it was clear that they had been inflicted on him. Harry had been murdered. He was covered in blood, and police would later establish that he had been bludgeoned around the head with a blunt instrument. A search of the house and the scene was conducted for the murder weapon, but none could be found. The implication was that the killer had taken the weapon with them. Police had a huge job in this case. Trying to establish the circumstances surrounding Harry's murder was proving tricky, given that his body had clearly been in the flat for many days before it was discovered. 
Creating a timeline for Harry's last days and trying to figure out when he had last been seen alive was a difficult thing to do. However, it was finally established that he had last been seen alive on the 5th of November and that the warden had last spoken to him the next morning on the 6th. Whatever had happened, the motive for the murder seemed to be more transparent. Harry had been robbed, and it seemed that burglary had been the motive for the murder. The crime scene indicated that several items had been stolen from Harry's flat. Thousands of pounds had been taken, as well as Harry's brown wallet. Other items, such as a gold watch that once belonged to Elsie, had been taken as well. The watch was relatively distinctive and had an inscription on the back, which read, To Harry Flegg, presented upon his retirement. Harry's set of house keys, which had around 12 keys on the bunch, were also missing. The police were sure that this had been a robbery, however there were still some odd things about the scene. They had discovered that despite the flat being robbed, there were some valuables that the killer or killers had missed. A stash of £2,000 was discovered in the home, as well as money that was still on Harry's body that had either been left or missed. Police would later discover that Harry kept most of his money in his flat and that he didn't believe in putting his money into banks or building societies. This meant that he always had a relatively large amount of money in his home or on him at all times. He was also not shy about discussing this with other people and would often tell others that he carried a lot of money with him or that he kept money at his home. This was certainly a risk factor when discussing Harry as a victim and was a potential motive for whoever had killed him. Had Harry got talking to the wrong person about his life savings? Had this person took the opportunity to attack and rob him? The police were quite sure that robbery had been the main motive, however they also had to consider, had this person been involved with the strange note that appeared on Harry's door? and the card that had been left in the glass. Had this been a way to buy the killer or killer's time to get far enough away from the scene? If this was the case, then they had indeed bought themselves the time that they needed. The other odd part of this puzzle was the consideration that the man that had been seen in the cafe with Harry on the morning of the 5th of November and the man who had visited Burton's confectioners were in any way involved with the murder or were even the same man. One piece of quite damning evidence that pointed to the fact that the man at the bakery who had ordered the beef and horseradish sandwiches had been with Harry that day was the recovery of both of the uneaten sandwiches in the paper bag from the bakery in Harry's flat when his body was discovered. This was a clear indication that this man had indeed been buying sandwiches for Harry, but the reason why they were never eaten was unclear. It was obvious that Harry had been murdered shortly after the 5th of November, and so his movements and who he spoke to and saw that day were important to the investigation. The investigation got started immediately, but the lack of concrete evidence and the time that had elapsed between the murder and the discovery of the body made it tricky to gain any traction. In January of 1989, Harry's case got a boost when it was featured on BBC's Crime Watch programme. The programme reconstructed Harry's day on the 5th of November and laid out all of the evidence that the police had, including a description of the man that had been seen with Harry at the cafe and the man that had been in the bakery and bought the sandwiches. The arrival of the note on the door was also reconstructed and what each of the witnesses had seen that day. It was hoped that the reconstruction would bring forward new witnesses and perhaps new information. Superintendent Bill Hacking appeared on the programme and later said about the crime. Certainly people knew about his nest egg. The £2,000 found confirms our belief that robbery was the motive. The money was not easily noticeable and it may well be that the killer or killers thought they had all his money and didn't continue to look further. Mr Howell also carried a substantial amount of cash on him in a brown fold-over wallet, which we are trying to find. 
The Crime Watch reconstruction elicited a hundred calls from the public, and police were hopeful that these calls would result in some new information that could help boost the investigation. The calls were checked on and lines of inquiry were followed up on, however none led to anyone being arrested for Harry's murder. This was of course disappointing for the police, and they had hoped that national coverage would lead to at least the two men being identified by someone in the public. Harry's murder was featured on the programme a second time, and it was hoped that this time would lead to further progress, but sadly, Harry's murder remained unsolved despite the coverage. Harry's family had to come to terms with the fact that he had been brutally murdered, and the person or persons responsible were still out there, and had not been brought to justice. This must have been frustrating and heartbreaking for them. Police were left with many unanswered questions about Harry's murder. Had Harry known his killer? Was it one of the men who he was seen with that day? What weapon had he been killed with? Had the killer left the note on the front door? Was this note anything to do with the man that the window cleaner had seen knocking on that day? None of these questions could be answered with the evidence that they had and this will have been a huge source of frustration. Another tragic case is often cited in relation to Harry's, and that's the murder of Jack Shuttleworth in August of 1989. 88-year-old Jack lived alone in his home in Ingleton in North Yorkshire. He was found inside his shed and he had been battered to death and had suffered several blows to the head with what was later discovered to be a piece of wood. There was no apparent motive aside from the fact that Jack's wallet had been stolen. Jack was somewhat of a loner who didn't invite people into his home that often and so who this killer was or how they got into his home was unclear. If Jack had invited this person in, it was out of character. Police in this case were able to figure out who this perpetrator could be and it would turn out that Jack had done something out of character that day. He had met a young man named Brian Newcomb while working on his car and had struck up a friendly conversation, most probably about vehicles. Newcomb knew a lot about cars, as did Jack, and he invited him into his home for a cup of tea. This would be a fateful decision and Brian Newcomb later murdered him in cold blood and stole his wallet. Newcomb was a career criminal and had convictions for a host of things like theft of money and jewellery. He was not, until Jack's murder, wanted for any violent offences, but he was wanted for the theft of £35,000 worth of stolen jewellery. Police were able to trace what he did next. He travelled to Preston and bought a bus ticket going to Inverness in Scotland. It was in Scotland that he met Margaret McConey, a 55-year-old widow. He travelled around the Orkney Islands with Margaret on a six-day trip, and the relationship developed quickly, with McConey telling friends that Newcomb had proposed to her. It wasn't long after, on the 16th of August, that another tragic event took place. Brian Newcomb hit Margaret McConey over the head with a rock on a hillside and Newcomb stole her checkbook. When her body was discovered on the 24th of August, a manhunt was launched for Brian Newcomb and he was found in Mansfield on the 30th of August. He was arrested and it was reported that he confessed to murdering both Jack Shuttleworth and Margaret McConey. While in custody, Brian Newcomb hanged himself ten weeks later in his cell while awaiting trial. The reason that Harry's case is brought up in connection with Jack's case in particular are the similarities between the two. Harry and Jack were both quite private people. While Harry was sociable while out and about, he didn't often invite people round, and neither did Jack. However, he did make an exception for Brian Newcomb. Newcomb seemed to have got Jack talking about cars and being a mechanic, and Harry also had a background in this. Newcomb was motivated by money and theft, 
And so if he had heard that Harry kept his savings at his flat, then this could have been a motive. Both men had severe head wounds and their wallets were stolen. Newcomb was also known to travel around the country and spent a lot of time in the north where both of these murders took place. While these similarities are quite compelling, it's hard to know whether they do indicate that Newcomb was Harry's killer, and of course this would be all speculative. The interesting feature for me is this idea that someone could have gained Harry's trust long enough for them to get inside his flat, and I do believe that this is a plausible explanation for how someone got close enough to Harry to kill him and steal his money. Harry's case sadly remains unsolved, with all of the same questions left without solid answers. A Lancashire Police spokesperson in 2018 spoke about Harry's case, and unsolved cases in general, saying, This case, as with all undetected murders, remains open. No unsolved murder or serious sexual assault is ever closed and we remain committed to delivering closure and support for the victims and their families, as well as reassuring our communities regardless of the passage of time. Undetected cases are regularly reviewed by a senior investigating officer who investigates any new lines of inquiry should new opportunities, such as advances in scientific techniques or new information, become available. It's important that those who have committed appalling crimes, however long ago, are brought to justice, so that we can bring comfort to those loved ones still waiting for answers. I think it's important to remember that Harry was someone's loved one, and his family deserved to know what happened to him and why, and there is always hope that we will discover who committed this awful murder. If you know anything about Harry Howell's murder in Blackpool in 1988, then please contact Lancashire Police on 101. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you'd like to support the podcast further, then you can on Patreon and contribute to the exclusive polls to get extra bonus episodes every month. You can also get access to new episodes early and ad-free. You can use the link in the show notes to visit Patreon and see what we offer. You can also support us by reviewing the podcast wherever you listen, including Spotify, and also just share the episodes. You can subscribe on YouTube and follow us on social media. You can also now subscribe and listen to my new podcast, 10 Minute True Crime, which tells infamous crimes in a short form, bite-sized 10 minutes, for people on the go or who just like the facts. Find that wherever you listen and in the show notes. As always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen.